Once a staid and boring business dominated by IBM, Oracle, and at the time, newcomer Microsoft, along with a handful of wannabes, the database business has exploded in the past decade and has become a staple of financial excellence, customer experience, analytic advantage, competitive strategy, growth initiatives, visualizations, not to mention compliance, security, privacy, and dozens of other important use cases and initiatives. You know, on the vendor side of the house, we've seen the rapid ascendancy of cloud databases, most notably from Snowflake, whose massive raises leading up to its IPO in late 2020 sparked a spate of interest and VC investment in the separation of compute and storage and all that elastic resource stuff in the cloud. The company joined AWS, Azure, and Google to popularize cloud databases, which have become a linchpin of competitive strategies for technology suppliers. And, you know, if I get you to put your data in my database and in my cloud, and I keep innovating, I'm going to build a moat and achieve a hugely attractive lifetime customer value in a really amazing marginal economics dynamic that was going to fund my future. And I'll be able to sell other adjacent services, not just compute and storage, but machine learning and inference and training and all kinds of stuff, dozens of lucrative cloud offerings. Meanwhile, the database leader Oracle has invested massive amounts of money to maintain its lead. It's building on its position as the king of mission critical workloads and making typical Oracle-like claims against the competition. Most recently, just yesterday with another announcement around MySQL Heatwave, an extension of MySQL that is compatible with on-premises MySQL and is setting new standards in price performance. We're seeing a dramatic divergence in strategies across the database spectrum. On the far left, we see Amazon with more than a dozen database offerings, each with its own API and primitives. AWS is taking a right tool for the right job approach, often building on open source platforms and creating services that it offers to customers to solve very specific problems for developers. And on the other side of the line, we see Oracle, which is taking a Swiss army knife approach, converging database functionality, enabling analytic and transactional workloads to run in the same data store, eliminating the need to ETL, at the same time, adding capabilities into its platform like automation and machine learning. Welcome to this database power panel. My name is Dave Vellante and I'm so excited to bring together some of the most respected industry analysts in the community. Today, we're going to assess what's happening in the market. We're going to dig into the competitive landscape and explore the future of database and database platforms and decode what it means to customers. Let me take a moment to welcome our guest analyst today. Matt Kimball is a vice president and principal analyst at More Insights and Strategy. Matt, he's into, he knows products, he knows industry, he's got real world IT expertise, and he's got all the angles, 25 plus years of experience and, and all kinds of great background. Matt, welcome, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Holger Muller, friend of theCUBE, vice president and principal analyst at Constellation Research, in-depth knowledge on applications, application development, knows developers, he's worked at SAP and Oracle. And then Bob Evans is chief content officer and co-founder of the Acceleration Economy, founder and principal of Cloud Wars. He covers all kinds of industry topics and great insights, insights. He's got awesome videos, these three minute hits. If you haven't seen him, check him out. Knows cloud companies, you know, these Cloud Wars minutes are fantastic. And then of course, Mark Stamer is the founder of Dragon Slayer Research, a frequent contributor and guest analyst at Wikibon. He's got a wide ranging knowledge across IT products, knows technology really well, can go deep. And then of course, Ron Westfall, senior analyst and director, research director at Futurum Research. Great all around product, trends, knowledge, can take you know, technical dives and, and really understands competitive angles, knows Redshift, Snowflake, and many others. G gents, thanks so much for taking the time to join us in theCUBE today. It's great to have you on. Good to see you. Good to be here, thanks Peter. for having us. Thanks, Dave. All right, let's start with an around the horn and briefly, if each of you would describe, you know, anything I missed in your areas of expertise and then answer the following question. How would you describe the state of the database, data platform market today? Matt Kimball, please start. Oh, I hate going first, but that's okay. Um, how would I describe the, the, uh, the world today? Um, I would just, in one sentence, I would say, I'm glad I'm not in IT anymore, um, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a, it is a complex and dangerous world out there. Uh, and I don't envy IT folks that have to support 
you know, these modernization and transformation uh, efforts that are going on within the enterprise. You know, it used to be, you know, you mentioned it, Dave, you would argue about IBM versus Oracle versus this newcomer uh, in the database space called uh, Microsoft. And don't forget Sybase back in the day. Um, but, you know, now it's not just, you know, which SQL vendor am I going to go with? It's, you know, all of these different and divergent data types uh, that have to be uh, taken, uh, they have to be, uh, they have to be merged together, synthesized, and somehow uh, I have to do that cleanly and use this to drive strategic decisions for my business. Um, that is not easy. So, you know, you have to look at it from the perspective of, of the business user. It's great for them because as a DevOps person or as an analyst, I have so much flexibility and I have this thing called the cloud now where I can go get services immediately. As an IT person or a DBA, um, I am calling up uh, prevention hotlines 24 hours a day because I don't know how I'm going to be able to support the business. And as an Oracle or as an Oracle or a, uh, or a Microsoft or um, some of the cloud providers and cloud databases out there, I'm licking my chops because you know I have you know I have you know my my market is expanding and expanding uh, every day. Great, thank you for that, Matt. Holger, how do you see the world these days? You always have a good perspective on things. Share with us. Well, I think it's the best time to be in IT. I'm not sure what Matt is talking about. It's easier than easier than ever, right? The direction is going to cloud. Kubernetes is one. Google has the best AI for now, right? So things are easier than ever where before you made commitments for five plus years on hardware, networking, and so on on-premise. And I got gray hair about worrying was the wrong decision. No, just kidding. But you can have both sides. Just, just to be controversial, make it interesting, right? So yeah, no, I think the interesting thing, specifically the databases, right? We have this big suite versus best of breed, right? Obviously innovation, like you mentioned with Snowflake and others happening in the cloud, the cloud vendors have a word to say with their databases. And then we have uh, one of the few survivors of the old guard, as Amazon likes to call them, of Oracle, who's doing well, both the traditional database and now, which is really interesting and remarkable from that because for Oracle it was always the power of one, have one database, add more to it, make it what I call the universal database. And now uh, this new heat wave offering is coming and uh, my SQL open source side. So they're getting the second leg, right? So it's interesting that older players, traditional players who still are in the market are diversifying the offering, something we don't see so much from the traditional to foes from Oracle on the Microsoft side or the IBM side these days. Great, mm -hmm. thank you, Olga. Uh, Bob Evans, you've covered this business for a while. You've worked at you know, a number of different outlets and companies and you cover the competition. How, how do you see things? Dave, you know, uh, the other angle to look at this from is from the customer side, right? You've got now CEOs who are of any sort of business across all sorts of industries and they understand that their future success is going to be dependent on their ability to become a digital company, to understand data, to use it the right way. So as you outlined, Dave, I think in your intro there, uh, it is a fantastic time to be in the database business. And I think we've got a lot of new buyers and influencers coming in. They don't know all this history about IBM and Microsoft and Oracle and you know whoever else. So I think they're going to take a long, hard look, Dave, at some of these results and um, who is able to help these companies not serve up the best technology, but who's going to be able to help their business move into the digital future. So it's a, it's a fascinating time now from every perspective. You know, great points, Bob. I mean, digital transformation has gone from buzzword to, to imperative. Uh, Mr. Stamer, how do you see things? I see things a little bit differently than my peers here in that I see the database market being segmented. There's the all the different kinds of databases that people are looking at for different kinds of data. And then there is databases in the cloud. And so databases are cloud service. I view very differently than databases because the traditional way of implementing a database is changing and it's changing rapidly. So one of the premises that you stated earlier on was that you viewed Oracle as a database company. I don't view Oracle as a database company anymore. I view Oracle as a cloud company that happens to have a significant expertise and specialty in databases. And they still sell database software in the traditional way, but ultimately they're a cloud company. So database cloud services, from my point of view, is a very distinct market from databases. Okay, well, we got that's you gave us some good, good meat on the bone to talk about that. Last but not least, Ron Westfall. Dave, Dave, did Mark just say Oracle is a cloud company? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take away the database. It would, it would be interesting to have that discussion. But let's let Ron jump in here. Ron, yeah. give us your take. That's a great segue. I think it's truly the era of the cloud database. That 
something that's rising. And the key trends that come with it include, for example, elastic scaling. That is the ability to scale on demand, uh, to right size workloads according to customer requirements. And also, I think it's going to increase the prioritization for high availability. That is the player who can provide the highest availability is going to have, I think, a great deal of success in this emerging market. And also, I anticipate that there will be more consolidation across platforms in order to enable cost savings for customers. And that's something that's always going to be important. And I think we'll see uh, more of that over the horizon. And then finally, security. Uh, security will be more important than ever. Uh, we've seen a spike in rare. Uh, we certainly have seen geopolitical originated cybersecurity concerns. And as a result, I see uh, database security becoming all, all the more important. Great, thank you. Okay, let me share some data with you guys. I'm going to throw this at you and see what you think. We have this awesome data partner called Enterprise Technology Research, ETR. They do these quarterly surveys in each period with dozens of industry segments. They track client spending, customer spending. And, and this is the database data warehouse sector, okay? So it's, it's taxonomy, so it's not perfect, but it's a big kind of chunk. They essentially ask customers within a category and by a specific vendor, you're spending more or less on the, on the platform. And then they subtract the lesses from the mores and they derive a metric called net score. It's like NPS, it's a measure of spending velocity. It's more complicated and granular than that, but that's the, ba the basis and that's the vertical axis. The horizontal axis is what they call market share. It's not like IDC market share, it's just pervasiveness in the data set. Uh, and so there are a couple of things that stand out here and that we can use as reference point. The first is the momentum of Snowflake. They've been off the charts for many, many, for over two years now. Anything above that dotted red line, that 40% is considered by ETR to be highly elevated. And no, Snowflake's even way above that. And I think it's, 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 it's probably not sustainable. We're going to see in the next April survey next month from those guys when it comes out. And then you see AWS and Microsoft they're really pervasive on the, on the horizontal axis and highly elevated. They, Google falls behind them. And then you got a number of well-funded players. You got Cockroach Labs, Mongo, Redis, MariaDB, which of course is a fork on MySQL, started almost as protest at Oracle when they acquired Sun and they got MySQL. And you can see the number of others. Now Oracle, who's the leading database player, despite what Mark Stamer says, um, we know and they're, in the, they're a cloud player who happens to be a leading database player. They dominate in the mission critical space. We know that they're the king of that sector, but you can see here that they're kind of legacy, right? They've been around a long time. They get a big install base. So they don't have the spending momentum of the vertical axis. Now remember this, this is just really, this doesn't capture spending levels just so that understates Oracle, but nonetheless, so it's, a, it's, it's not a complete picture, like SAP for instance is not in here, no HANA. I think people are actually buying it, but it doesn't show up here. But it does give an indication of momentum and presence. So Bob Evans, I want to start with you. you. You've commented on many of these companies. You know, what does this data tell you? Yeah, you know, Dave, I think that all these uh, compilations of things like that are interesting. I, that folks at ETR do some good work, but I think, as you said, it's a snapshot, sort of a two-dimensional thing of a rapidly changing three-dimensional world. Um, you know, the, the, the incidents at which some of these companies are mentioned versus the volume that happens. Um, I think it's, you know, with, with Oracle, and I, I'm not going to declare my, my religious affiliation, either as cloud company or database company, uh, you know, they're, they're all of those things and more. And I think some of our old language of how we classify companies is just not relevant anymore. But um, I want to ask, too, something in here. The, the autonomous database from Oracle, nobody else has done that. So either Oracle is crazy, and it, they trotted out a technology that nobody uh, other than them is interested in, or they're onto something that nobody else can match. So to me, Dave, uh, within Oracle, trying to identify how they're doing there, I would watch autonomous database growth too, because right, it's either going to be a big player and it breaks through, or it's going to be caught behind. Um, so, uh, and the snowflake phenomenon, as you mentioned, that is a rare, rare bird who comes up and can grow 100% at a billion dollar revenue level like that. So now they've had a chance to come in, scare the crap out of everybody, rock the market with something totally new, the data cloud, 
Will the bigger companies be able to catch up and offer a compelling alternative or is Snowflake going to continue to be this outlier? It's, it's a fascinating time. Really interesting points there, Holger. I want to ask you, I mean, so when you, I've talked to certainly, and I'm sure you guys have too, the founders of, of Snowflake, they came out of Oracle and they actually, they, they don't apologize. They say, hey, we, we're, we're not going to do all that complicated stuff that Oracle does. We were trying to keep it real simple. But at the same time, you know, they don't do sophisticated workload management. They don't do complex joins. They're kind of relying on the ecosystem. So, so when you look at the data like this and the various momentums that we talked about mm -hmm. the, the diverging strategies, what does this say to you? Well, it's a great point. And I think Snowflake is an example how the cloud can turbocharge a well understood concept, in this case, the data warehouse, right? You move that and you find steroids and you see like, but some players who've been big in data warehouse, like say Teradata as an example here in San Diego, um, what could have been for them, right, in that part. The interesting thing, the problem so is the cloud hides a lot of complexity too, which you can scale really well as you attract lots of customers to go there. And you don't have to build things like what Bob said, right? One of the fascinating things, right? Nobody's answering Oracle on the autonomous database. I, I don't think it's a, that they cannot, they just have different priorities or the database is not such a priority. I would dare to say that is for IBM and uh, Microsoft right now at the moment. And the cloud vendors, you just hide that, right? Through scripts and through scale because you support thousands of customers and you can deal with a little more complexity, right? It's not against them. Whereas if you have to run it yourself, very different story, right? You want to have the autonomous parts. You want to have the, the powerful tools to do things. Thank you. And so Matt, I want to go to you. You said up front, you know, it's just complicated if you're in IT, it's a complicated situation. And you've been on the customer side. And if you're a buyer, it's obviously, it's like Holger said, cloud's supposed to make this stuff easier, but the simpler it gets, the more complicated it gets. So where do you place your bets? Or I guess more importantly, how do you decide where to place your bets? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, to what to what Bob and Holger said, you know, the around autonomous database, I think, you know, part of, um, as I, you know, play kind of a armchair psychologist, if you will, corporate psychologist, I look at what Oracle's doing and, you know, databases where they've made their mark and it's kind of, it, it is their, it, that's their, their strong position, right? So it makes sense if you're making an entry into this cloud and you really want to kind of build momentum, you go with where, what you're good at, right? So that's kind of the strength of, of Oracle. Let's, let's put a lot of focus on that. They do a lot more than uh, database. Don't get me wrong, but you know, I'm kind of gonna, I'm gonna short my, my, my strength and then kind of uh, pivot from there. With regards to you know what what IT looks at, what I would look at is uh, you know as an IT director or somebody who is is you know trying to consume services from these different um, service from these different uh, cloud providers. First and foremost, I go with what I know, right? It, it, we let's not forget IT is a conservative group, and when we look at you know all the different permutations of, of database types out there, SQL, NoSQL, all the different types of NoSQL. Those are largely being being deployed by business users that are looking for agility or businesses that are being that are looking for agility. You know, the reason why MongoDB is so popular is because of DevOps, right? It's a it's a great platform to develop on. Um, and that's and that's that's where it kind of gained its traction. But as an IT person, I want to go with what I know, where my muscle memory is, and and that's my first, that's my first position. Um, and so as I evaluate different cloud service providers and cloud databases. I look for, you know, what I know and what I've invested in and where my muscle memory is. Do I have, is there enough there? And do I have enough belief that that company or that service is going to be able to take me to, you know, where I see my organization in five years from a data management perspective, from a business perspective, are they going to be there? Um, and if they are, then I'm a little bit more willing to make that investment. Mm -hmm. But it is, you know, if, if I'm kind of going in this blind or if I'm cloud native, you know, that's where the snowflakes of, of the world become very attractive to me. Oh, thank you. So Mark, I, I asked, asked Andy Jassing the Cube one time, you have all these, you know, data stores and different APIs and primitives and, you know, very granular. What's the strategy there? And he said, hey, that allows us as the market changes, it allows us to be more flexible. If we start building abstractions layers, it's harder for us. I think also it, it gave Amazon a good time to market advantage. But, but let me ask you, I described early on that spectrum <laughs> from AWS to Oracle. We just saw yesterday Oracle announced, I think the third major enhancement in like 15 months to MySQL Heatwave. What yep. do you make of that announcement? How do you think it impacts the competitive landscape, particularly as it relates to, you know, converging transaction and analytics, eliminating ELT? I know you have some thoughts on this. 
So let, let me back up for a second and defend my cloud statement about Oracle for a moment. <laughs> uh, AWS did a great job in developing the cloud market in general, in everything in the cloud market. I mean, I give them lots of kudos on that. And a lot of what they did is they took open source software and they, sell, and they rent it to people who use their cloud. So I give them lots of credit, they dominate the market. Oracle was late to the cloud market. In fact, they actually poo-pooed it initially. If you look at some of Larry Ellison's statements, they said, oh, it's never going to take off. And then they did 180 turn. And they said, oh, we're going to embrace the cloud. And they really have. But when you're late to a market, you've got to be compelling. And this, this ties into the announcement yesterday, but let's deal with this compelling. To be compelling from a user point of view, you got to be twice as fast, offer twice as much functionality at half the cost. That's generally what compelling is. You're going to capture market share from the leaders who establish the market. It's very difficult to capture market share in a new market for yourself. And you're right. I mean, Bob was correct in this and, and, and Holger and Matt, in which you look at, uh, at Oracle and they did a great job of leveraging their database to move into this market. Give them lots of kudos for that too. But yesterday they announced, as you said, the third innovation release and the pace is just amazing of what they're doing on these releases on Heatwave that ties together initially MySQL with an integrated built-in analytics engine, so a data warehouse built in. And then they added automation with autopilot and now they've added machine learning to it and it's all in the same service. It's not something you can buy and put on your premise unless you buy their cloud and customer stuff, but generally it's a cloud offering. So it's compellingly better as far as the integration. You don't buy multiple services, you buy one and it's lower cost than any of the other services. But more importantly, it's faster, which again, give them credit for. They have more integration of a product they uh, can tie things together in a way that nobody else does. There's no additional services, ETL services like Glue and AWS. So from, from that perspective, they're getting better performance, fewer services, lower cost. Hmm, they're aiming at the compelling side again. So from a customer point of view, it's compelling. Matt, you wanted to say something there. Yeah, I, I want to kind of, on, on what you just said there, Mark, and this is something I found really interesting, you know, it, the traditional way that you look at software and, and you know, purchasing software and IT is, you know, you look at either best of breed solutions uh, and you have to work on the back end to integrate them all and make them all work well. And generally, you know, the, the big, you know, the big hit against the, you know, we have one integrated offering is that, you know, you lose capability or you lose, you lose depth of features, right? And to what you were saying, you know, that's the thing I found interesting about what Oracle is doing is they're building in depth as they kind of, you know, build that service. It's not like you're losing a lot of capabilities, you know, because you're going to one integrated service versus having to use A versus B versus C. Um, and you're I right. love that. I love that idea. Yeah, not only you're not losing, but you're gaining functionality that you can't get by integrating a lot of these. I mean, I can take Snowflake and integrate it in with machine learning, but I also have to integrate it in with a transactional database. So I've got to have connectors between all of this, which means I'm adding time. And what it comes down to at the end of the day is expertise, effort, time, and cost. Yeah. And so what I see the difference from the, the Oracle announcements is they're aiming at reducing all of that by increasing performance as well. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that's what I saw to the announcement yesterday. Yeah, the, you know, uh, one thing on yeah. the market, it's funny you say that because I started out saying, you know, I don't, I, I'm glad I'm not in IT anymore. And the reason is because of exactly what you said, you know, it's almost like there's a pseudo level of witchcraft that's required to support right. the modern data environment, right, in, in the enterprise. And I need simpler, faster, better. That's what I need. You know, I am no longer wearing pocket protectors. I am, I have turned from, you know, break fix kind of person to you know business consultant and i need to i need that point and click simplicity but i can't sacrifice you know uh depth of features or functionality on the back end as i play that consultancy role so ron i, I can't i, I, I want to ask ron, i want to bring in ron you know it's funny uh, so matt you you mentioned mongo i often say if, if oracle mentions you you're you're on the map we, we saw them yesterday ron <laughs> they hammered 
uh, Redshift's Auto ML. They took swipes at Snowflake, a little bit of BigQuery. Um, wh what were your thoughts on that? Do you agree with, with what these guys are saying in terms of heat waves capabilities? Yes, Dave, I think uh, that's an excellent question. And fundamentally, I do agree. And the question is why? And I think it's important to know that all of the Oracle data is backed by the fact that they're using benchmarks. Uh, for example, all of the ML and all of the TPC benchmarks, uh, including all the scripts, all the configs, and all the details are posted on GitHub. So anybody can look at these results and they're fully transparent and replicate themselves. If you don't agree with this data, then by all means, challenge it. And we have not really seen that in all of the new updates to Heatwave over the last 15 months. And as a result, when it comes to these you know, fundamentals and looking at the competitive landscape, which I think gives validity to outcomes such as Oracle being able to deliver 4.8 times better price performance than Redshift, as well as, uh, for example, 14.4 better price performance than Snowflake, and also 12.9 better uh, price performance than BigQuery. And so that is, you know, looking at the uh, quantitative side of things, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, to Mark's point and to Matt's point, there are also qualitative aspects that clearly differentiate uh, the Oracle proposition uh, from my perspective. For example, now uh, the MySQL Heatwave ML capabilities are native, uh, they're built in, and they also support things such as uh, completion criteria. And uh, as a result, of that enables them to show that, hey, when you're using Redshift ML, for example, uh, you're having to also use their SageMaker tool and it's running on a meter. And so, you know, nobody really wants to be running on a meter when, you know, uh, executing these incredibly complex tasks. And likewise, uh, when it comes to Snowflake, they have to uh, use a third party uh, capability. They, they don't have it built in, it's not native. So the user, they, they, to the point, is having to spend more time and it increases complexity to use auto ML capabilities across the Snowflake uh, platform. And also, I think it also applies to other important features such as data sampling. For example, uh, with the Heatwave ML, it's intelligent sampling that's being implemented. Whereas in contrast, we're seeing a Redshift using random sampling. And again, Snowflake, you're having to use a third party library in order to achieve the same capability. So I think the differentiation is crystal clear. I think it definitely is refreshing. It's showing that this is where true value can be assigned. And if you don't agree with it, by all means, challenge the data. Yeah, I want to come. I want to come to the benchmarks in a minute. Um, but I, by the way, you know the the gentleman who's the Oracle's architect, he did a great job on the call yesterday explaining yeah. what you have to do. I thought that was quite impressive. But Bob, Bob, I know you follow the financials pretty closely, and on the earnings call. Or earlier this month, Ellison said that we're going to see heat wave on AWS. And the skeptic in me said, oh, they must not be getting people to come to OCI. And then they, you remember this chart they showed yesterday, it showed the growth of heat wave on OCI, but of course there was no data on there. It was just sort of, you know, lines up and to the right. Um, <laughs> but so what do you guys think of that? Does it signal uh, Bob desperation by Oracle that they can't get traction on OCI or is it just really a smart TAM expansion move? What do you think? Yeah, Dave, that's a great question, you know, uh, along the way there. And, you know, just inside of that was uh, something that Ellis said, uh, Ellison said on the earnings call that spoke to a different sort of philosophy or mindset almost from Oracle. He said, we're going to make this multi-cloud, right? With a lot of their other cloud stuff, if you wanted to use any of Oracle's cloud software, you had to use Oracle's uh, infrastructure, OCI. There was no other way out of it. This one, uh, but I thought it was a classic Ellison line. He said, but we're making this available on AWS. We're making this available, uh, you know, on Snowflake because we're going after those users. And once they see what can be done here, so he's looking at it, um, I guess you could say it's a concession to customers because they want multi-cloud. The other way to look at it, it's a hunting expedition. And uh, it's one of those uniquely, I think, Oracle ways he set up front, right? He doesn't say, well, there's a big market. There's a lot for everybody. We just want our slice. He said, no, we're going after Amazon. We're going after Redshift. We're going after Aurora. We're going after these users of Snowflake and so on. And I think it's really fairly refreshing these days to hear somebody say that because now if I'm a buyer, I can look at that and say, you know, to Mark's point, do they measure up? Do they crack that threshold ceiling? Or is this just going to be more pain than a few dollar savings is worth? 
But you look at those numbers that Ron pointed out and that we all saw in that chart. I've never seen, Dave, anything like that in a substantive market, a new player coming in here and being able to establish differences that are four, seven, eight, 10, 12 times better than competition. And as new buyers look at that, they're going to say, what the hell are we doing paying, you know, five times more to get a poor result? What's going on here? So I think this is going to rattle people and force a harder, closer look at what these alternatives are. I wonder if the guy, thank you. I wonder if the let's just skip ahead of the benchmarks. Guys, bring up the next slide. Let's, let's skip ahead a little bit here, um, which talks to the benchmarks and the benchmarking, if we can. You know, David Floyer, the sort of semi-retired, your know, Wikibon analyst said, Dave, this is going to force Amazon and others, Snowflake, he said, to rethink actually how they architect uh, databases. And, and this is kind of a compilation of some of the data that they shared. They went after Redshift mostly, but also, you know, as I say, Snowflake, BigQuery. And you, you, like I said, you can always tell which companies are doing well because Oracle will come after you. But, but they, they're on the radar here. I, 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 Holger, do, should we take this stuff seriously? I mean, or is it you know, a grain of salt? What, what are your thoughts here? I think you have to take it seriously. I mean, that's a, that's a great question, great point on that. Because um, like, like, like Ron said, if there's a flaw in a benchmark, we know this database traditionally, right? If anybody came up there, everybody will poo poo, you put the wrong benchmark, it wasn't audited right, let us do it again and so on. We don't see this happening, right? So uh, kudos to Oracle um, to be, be aggressive, differentiated, and seem to having impeccable benchmarks. But what we really see, I think, in my view, is that the classic, and we can talk about this in 100 years, right, is the, the sweet versus best of breed, right? And um, the key question of the sweet, because the sweet's always lower, right? No matter at which level of the stack you have the sweet, uh, then the best of breed, they will come up with something new, use the cloud, uh, put, the, put the data warehouse on steroids, and so on. Um, the important thing is that you have to assess as a buyer, what is the speed of my suite vendor? And that's what you guys mentioned before as well, right? Uh, Mark said that and so on, right? This is the third release in one year of the Heatwave team, right? So um, everybody in the database open source market, and there's so many MySQL spin-offs to a certain point is put of chain on the speed of Nippon Agarwal's team, uh, putting out fundamental changes. And the beauty of that is, right, is so inherent to the Oracle value proposition, Larry's vision of building the IBM of the 21st century, right? From the silicon, from the chip, all the way across the seven stacks to the click of the user. And that's what makes the database, what Robert, Rob was saying, tied to the OCI infrastructure because it's designed for that, right? It runs uniquely better for that. This is why we see the cross connect to Microsoft. Heatwave, so it's different, right? Because Heatwave runs on cheap hardware, right? Which is the bread and butter 886 scale of any data, any cloud provider, right? So Oracle probably needs that to scale OCI in a different category, not the expensive side, but also allows to do what we said before, the multi-cloud capability, which ultimately CIOs really want because data gravity is real. You want to operate where that is. If you have a fast, innovative offering, which gives you more functionality and the R&D speed is really impressive for the space, puts everybody to silence, then it's, it's a good bet to look at. Yeah, so you're saying Dave, let me, that sweet versus Dave, best of breed. I just want to sort of play back then, Mark. I'll, I'll come yeah. to, that sweet yeah. versus best of breed, there's always been that trade-off. If I understand you, Holger, you're yeah. saying that somehow Oracle has magically cut through that trade-off and they're giving you the, the best of both. It's the development velocity, right? The provision of important features which matter to buyers of the sweet vendor eclipses the best of breed vendor. Then the best of breed vendor is in the hell of a potential trade -off. Yeah, Yeah, uh, go yeah. ahead, Mark. Yeah, and, and I want to add on what Holger just said there. I mean, the, the worst job in the data center is data movement. Moving the data sucks. I don't care who you are. Nobody likes it. You never get any kudos for doing it well. And you always get the ah craps when things go wrong. So it's In the data center, job. Mark, all the time, across data centers, across clouds, across data, that's right, where just, the bleeding it's, comes. It's, it's, right, it, yeah. you get beat up all the time. So nobody yeah. likes to move data, ever. So what you're looking at with the, what they announced with Heatwave and what I love about Heatwave is it doesn't matter when you started with it, you get all the additional features they announced. It's part of the service all the time. So, but uh, they don't have to move any of the data. You want to analyze the data that's in your transactional MySQL database? It's there. You want to do machine learning models? It's there. There's no data movement. The data movement is the key thing, and they just eliminate that in so many ways. 
And the other thing I wanted to talk about is on the benchmarks. As great as those benchmarks are, they're really conservative because they're underestimating the cost of that data movement. The, the ETLs, the other services, everything's left out. It's just comparing HeatWave, MySQL cloud service with HeatWave versus Redshift. That Redshift in Aurora and Glue, Redshift and Redshift ML and SageMaker, it's just Redshift. Yeah, so what you're saying is, what Oracle's doing is saying, okay, we're going to run MySQL HeatWave benchmarks on analytics against Redshift, and then we're going to run them in transaction against Aurora. But, right. you, but if, if you really had to look at what you would have to do with the ETL, you'd have to buy two different data stores and all the infrastructure around that, and that goes away. So, oh. Due to the nature of the competition, they're running narrow best of breed benchmarks. Uh -huh. There is no sweet uh, yeah. level benchmark because they exactly. created something new. Well, that's your earlier <laughs> point. They're beating best of breed with with a suite, and that, that's right. So that's to I guess to Floyer's earlier point. Um, that's going to shake things up. But but I want to come back to to Bob Evans because I want to tap your Cloud Wars mojo before we wrap and line up the horses. You got AWS, you got Microsoft, Google, and Oracle. Now they all own their own cloud. Snowflake, Mongo, Couchbase, Redis, Cockroach, by the way, they're all doing very well. They run in the cloud as do many others. I think you guys all saw the Andreessen, you know, commentary from, um, from Sarah Wong uh, and company to talk about the, the, the cost of goods sold impact of cloud. So running, owning your own cloud has to be an advantage because I got to, you know, pay other guys like Snowflake have to pay cloud vendors and negotiate down versus having the whole enchilada, Safra Katz's dream. Bob, how do you think this is going to impact the market long-term? Well, Dave, that's a great question about, you know, how this is all going to play out. If I could mention three things. One, uh, Frank Slootman has done a fantastic job with Snowflake, really good company before he got there. But since he's been there, the growth mindset, the discipline, the rigor, and the phenomenon of what Snowflake has done has forced all these bigger companies to really accelerate what they're doing. And again, it's an example of the, how this intense competition makes all the different cloud vendors better and it provides enormous value to customers. Second thing I wanted to mention here was, look at the Adam Solipsky effect at AWS. Took over in the middle of May and in Q2, Q3, Q4, AWS's growth rate accelerated. And in each of those three quarters, they grew faster than Microsoft's cloud, which has not happened in two or three years. So they're closing the gap on Microsoft. The third thing, Dave, in this, you know, incredibly intense competitive nature here, look at Larry Ellison, right? He's got his, you know, the product that for the last two or three years, he said it's going to help determine the future of the company autonomous database. You would think he's the last person in the world who's going to bring in it you know, in some ways, another database to think about there, but he has put, you know, his whole effort and energy behind this, the investments Oracle's made, he's riding this horse really hard. So it's not just a technology achievement, but it's also uh, an investment priority for Oracle going forward. And I think it's going to form a lot of who, how they position themselves to this new breed of buyer with a new type of need and expectations from IT. So I just think the next two or three years are going to be fantastic for people who are lucky enough to get to do the sorts of things that we do. You know, it's a great point you made about, about uh, AWS. Back in 2018, Q3, they were doing about 7.4 billion a quarter and they were growing in the mid forties. They dropped down to like 29% Q4 2020. I'm looking at the data now. They popped back up last quarter, last reported quarter to 40%, right. 17.8 yeah. billion. So they more than doubled and they, and they, and they accelerated the growth rate. So maybe that portends people are concerned about Snowflake right now, decelerating growth. You know, maybe that's going to be different. I do, by the way, I think Snowflake has a different strategy, the whole data cloud thing, data sharing. It's not, they're not trying to necessarily take Oracle head on, which is going to make this next 10 years really interesting. All right, we got to go. Last question, 30 seconds or less. What can we expect from the future of data platforms? Matt, please start. I have to go first again? You're killing me, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, you know, I think um, you're, you're going to see in the next, in the next few years, I think you're going to see the, the major players continue to meet customers where they are, right? It, every, every organization, every, every environment is, you know, kind of 
these these words bes bespoke and snowflake pardon the pun but snowflakes right but you know they're all opinionated and unique and what's great as a as an IT person is you know there is a service for me regardless of where I am on my journey in my data management journey um, I think you're going to continue to see uh, with regard specifically to Oracle I think you're going to see the company continue along this path of of being all things to all people if you will or all organizations um, without sacrificing uh, you know, kind of uh, richness of features and and sacrificing who they are. Right? Look, they are the data kings, right? I mean, they've been the, they've been a database uh, leader for an awful long time. I don't see that going away any anytime soon. And I love the innovative spirit they've brought in with uh, with Heatwave. All right, great, thank you. Okay, thirty seconds, Holger, go. Yeah, I mean, the the, the interesting thing that we see is is really that. Um, um, the trend to autonomous, as Oracle calls it, self-driving software, right? So the database will have to do more things than just store the data and support the DBA. It will have to show it can provide insights, the OLAP side, it will be able to show to one machine learning. We haven't really talked about that, how interesting, exciting, what kind of use case we can get of machine learning running real time on the data as it changes, right? So, which is part of the HeatWave announcement, right? So we'll see more of that self-driving nature in the database space. And because you said we can promote it, right? Check out my report about HeatWave, latest release already posted in oracle.com. Great, thank you for that. And uh, Bob Evans, please, you're, you're great at quick hits. Hit us. Uh, Dave, thanks. I, I really enjoyed getting to hear everybody's opinion here today. And I think what's going to happen too, I think there's a new generation of buyers, a new set of CXO influencers in here. And I think what Oracle's done with this uh, MySQL heat wave, those benchmarks that Ron talked about so eloquently here, that is going to become something that forces uh, other companies not just try to get incrementally better. I think we're going to see a massive new wave of innovation to try to play catch up. So I really take my hat off to Oracle's achievement. We're going to push everybody to be better. Excellent, Mark. Mark Stamer, what do you say? Sure, I'm going to I'm going to leverage off of something Matt said earlier. Those companies that are going to develop faster, cheaper, simpler products that are going to solve customer problems, IT problems, are the ones that are going to succeed or ones who are going to grow. The ones who are just focused on the technology are going to fall by the wayside. So those who can solve more problems, do it more elegantly, and do it for less money are going to do great. So Oracle is going down that path today. Snowflake's going down that path. Uh, they're trying to do more integration with third party, but a, as a result, aiming at that simpler, faster, cheaper men mentality is where you're going to continue to see this market go. Great. Amen, brother Mark. Thank you. Uh, Ron Westfall, we'll give you the last word, bring us home. Well, thank you. And I'm loving it. I, I see a wave of innovation across the entire cloud database ecosystem and Oracle is fueling it. We are seeing it with the native integration of auto ML capabilities. Elastic scaling, lower entry price points, et cetera. And this is just going to be great news for buyers, but also developers and increased use of open APIs. And so I think that is really the key takeaway is just we're going to see a lot of great innovation on the horizon here. Guys, fantastic insights. One of the best power panels I've ever done. Love to have you back. Thanks so much for, for coming on today. Great job, Dave. Thank you. All right, and thank you for watching. Yes. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE and we'll see you next time.